Tier 1 Math, Curriculum Units, and Math Instructional Guide Alignment, Guided Instruction, Part 1. In this session, we'll be diving into guided instruction. What is it? What does it look like? This session just provides a very brief overview. There is a guided instruction part two available that will provide a lot more details. When we think about math instruction in Philadelphia and we ask ourselves, what is it that we're striving toward? What do we want for our students? What do we believe will lead to meaningful learning? We turn to this definition that we provide in the math instructional guide. The mathematics classroom should be a space that centers children and fosters curiosity and joy. We are moving away from the gradual release model, I do, we do, you do, as the standard form of instruction and moving toward a model that leverages student thinking and assets. It is critical for all learners to engage in sense-making, discuss their ideas with their peers and make connections before and while engaging in guided instruction. This is the definition that will be driving this session and that drives our thinking around the math block and specifically around guided instruction. When we say all learners, we truly mean every child in our classroom. So here's our goals for this brief session. We want to explain very simply what guided instruction looks like. Then, we want to briefly reflect on how the opening routine and formative task set us up for successful guided instruction. And finally, we want to share some tools that can help you to plan guided instruction for your upcoming lessons. So what does guided instruction look like? On the right, you see a picture of Principles to Action, which is really a classic important book that was released by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and summarizes a lot of research and best practices. From pages eight and nine of that book, we see that research from both cognitive science and mathematics education supports the characterization of mathematics learning as an active process in which each student builds his or her own mathematical knowledge from personal experiences coupled with feedback from peers, teachers and adults, and themselves. Sorry for that little typo right there. When I see this quote, what, I, what stands out to me, what I notice, is this characterization of knowledge being something that we construct actively. Knowledge is not something that we pour into others, that we absorb. It's something that we do, we make, we construct. It's active. That is why we're shifting away from the more passive I do, we do, you do to a more active construction of knowledge for our students. We have some impactful practices for each component of the framework. Here are the three practices that are related to guided instruction. Specifically, the impactful practices recommend that teachers want to try to connect new concepts to the formative task, students' existing understandings, and their prior learning. When I read that, what I hear is, we are not just saying, here's some new knowledge. We're saying, hey, here is this thing, and here is how it builds on what you already know. All of our prior knowledge and understanding is relevant and supported and connected to our new content. The next one, the teacher facilitates the co-construction of pre-identified key ideas. If I were to elaborate on this, I would say pre-identified key ideas means we wanna make sure when we plan guided instruction, we're thinking about what are the most important things that my students need to walk away with? And how can I help co-construct that knowledge with students? What questions can I ask them that will help them to develop these new understandings? We're connecting to prior knowledge and we're co-constructing new knowledge together. We are also giving students opportunities to engage with tasks that are aligned to the learning target. Before we go into inclusive student activities, 
we want to make sure students do have a chance to try out their new learning with some support from the teacher. That's very high level. I'm sure we want to see it in a little more detail. So when we think of guided instruction, it has these two parts. It's like a cycle. We connect and explain, which means we develop and co-construct new knowledge, and we give students an opportunity to apply and practice. So when we connect to what students know and did in the opening routine and formative task, and we use their voices to explain new concepts, we're connecting and explaining. If I were to think about connect and explain, I would say this is where we do a couple of problems together. We walk through problems that students haven't seen before so we can figure out together how to do them. Then once we've done a couple of problems together, we give students a chance to do a couple of problems independently or with a partner. This is their chance to apply what they know, to see that thing that we just learned together. Did it really stick? Do I understand it? And if not, maybe we'll do another example together as a class. And then maybe I'll practice another one myself. It's a cycle of creating new knowledge and applying new knowledge. Here's what this could look like in about 15 minutes. We start off with connect and explain. So I might pose a math question problem on the board and I would walk through it with students. I would do as much of the pushing on them as opposed to myself. I would ask them questions rather than telling them. But together, we're doing a problem. We're gaining new knowledge around the learning target. Then for about five minutes, they're trying a problem or two on their own while I circulate to offer support and to see how they're doing. Then for the last five minutes, we'll come back together. Depending on how they did with apply and practice, I might realize, whoa, we need to do another one together. Or maybe my learning target is really complex and we need to do another one together that takes the learning a step further. Or maybe I wanna show some of their work that they completed during the apply and practice and talk about it together. Guided instruction is roughly 15 minutes of creating new knowledge, applying new knowledge, creating new knowledge, applying new knowledge. It's a cycle. So I'm gonna do a couple of true or false questions related to what we just talked about and to guided instruction in general. True or false. The teacher should connect and explain all new content in relation to the learning target. Think to yourself, true or false. This one's a little tricky. Our answer here is false. And the reason is because of the part that says the teacher should. We really want this to be a co-construction. So it could read, the teacher and students should connect and explain all new content in relation to the learning target. It's not all about the teacher, but yes, we are talking about new content related to the learning target. Next question, true or false? During the apply and practice, students should independently and silently practice several problems aligned to the learning target. Well, this one, I would say, is also a little bit tricky. Yes, they are practicing problems related to the learning target, but this is false for a couple of reasons. First, it doesn't have to be independent and silent. Students could work with a partner and the teacher could support as well if needed. The other reason it's false is that there's not time to do several problems. We just wanna give them one or two key problems to see if they are able to solve them and to give them that opportunity. True or false, it's okay if not all students have fully mastered the learning target by the end of guided instruction. They will continue to refine their understanding through more practice, centers, and even SGI during inclusive student activities. This one's true. I will say, if we go back to this cycle, if you learn new content, 
apply new content, and you realize, oh my goodness, my students are having a lot of trouble. Yes, of course, go back and do another one together. But you don't want to just keep drilling it and drilling it and drilling it. At a certain point, you want to move on to ISA. That way, there's this more differentiated opportunity to meet students where they are. Maybe only a few students didn't understand, and you can target that in SGI. Maybe there's a prerequisite skill that was preventing them from understanding, and you have a center that will address that. We don't want to stay in guided instruction too long because think about how much attention your students can give before they start to tune out. At a certain point, we want to move on to ISA. So we don't have a video to show you what this could look like, but we want to try to paint a picture by sharing a couple of scenarios. As I share the two scenarios with you, I want you to think about how does the more like side better engage students as active thinkers and sense makers than the less like side? This scenario is found in your virtual handout. So far, the virtual handout has some screenshots of different slides that we've gone over. But if you go down to number four, it says more like, less like. As you read, think about how does the more like scenario better engage students as active thinkers and sense makers than the less like side. That next page has the more like scenario and the less like scenario. It's a full page long. You're not going to be able to read it on my screen. So go back to that virtual handout that you should have a link to read through it, thinking about that question. So go ahead and pause the video to read the two scenarios. Welcome back. Hopefully you read the two scenarios. And I want you to think about these questions. Again, how did the more like side better engage students as active thinkers and sense makers? And what new insight does this give you into your own guided instruction? Related to the second question, I'm hoping that it painted a bit of a picture. It gave you a model of the types of questions that a teacher might ask, of the ways that a teacher would actively involve students in the construction of knowledge. Related to that first question, here are some ideas that I thought about. First, the first more like scenario, the teacher really connected guided instruction to the formative task. So my students were able to really make those active connections and recognize that their prior learning had value. If I go back to the virtual handout, we see that teacher referring back to the formative task in a meaningful way. Second, the teacher was more of a facilitator. They asked questions rather than telling students what to do or how to do it. Look, there are times when we need to model, when we need to show and explain, but there are also a lot of times where we don't have to do that, where we can step back and ask questions to our students. Can someone add on? How does this help us to find an equivalent fraction? Again, who can add on? Uh, let's see. I wonder if we can create another equivalent fraction. The teacher's asking questions. I only highlighted a couple, but the teacher is asking rather than telling. Lastly, the students played an active role in the co-construction of new learning. They weren't sitting passively taking notes. They weren't just listening, bored, absorbing knowledge. They were thinking, they were doing, they were puzzling. They might have been confused at moments, and that's okay because they were thinking and contributing to their learning. All right, that's a big picture overview of guided instruction. If I go back, I wanna just remind us that guided instruction has two parts. It takes about 15 minutes. Together, we construct new knowledge by asking lots of questions and walking through a couple of problems. And then students try out a couple of problems. Let's situate this back into the grander scheme of the math block by thinking about the opening routine and formative tasks. Our framework is a framework for access and acceleration. Our opening routines provide access to the formative task. 
They get students to activate their thinking, to remind them of ideas or terms or models that will be helpful when they get to the formative task, which also provides access to guided instruction. The formative task gives students an opportunity to try out a problem, to solve a problem using strategies they know and that they already are familiar with, to think about what models they like before we think about new strategies, new models, new approaches, new vocabulary. It's all about access. So the key idea is that 10 minutes, 20 minutes, we spent the first 30 minutes of class really centering our students' voices and our students' ideas as we accelerated their learning and created access to guided instruction and the learning target. We often hear people saying, especially after COVID, that their students are missing some of the prerequisite skills and knowledge that they need to get to the learning target. The opening routine and formative tasks are a built-in way to address those prerequisite skills, to remind students of strategies, vocabulary, models they may have forgotten. Use those first two components as a way to help set you up for guided instruction. Let's think about planning. In our pacing guides, we have multiple resources that can help you to plan guided instruction. Unlike the opening routine and formative task, we don't give you the exact problems you might want to use, and that's because we want guided instruction to be specific to your students. But we provide you with these um, English learner, special education, and tier strategies that you can reference and use to create guided instruction. We provide questions that you might use to ask students during guided instruction, and we align to envision expressions, engage New York, and illustrative math. Because for guided instruction, you're going to need to pull a couple of problems to do together, a couple of problems for them to do alone. And these places are where you can pull those problems from. We also have a guided instruction planning tool. This is found in your virtual handout. You see a screenshot of it and you also see a link to the full document. It's a lot of small font here, so you're going to want to pause to skim through it. As you skim through, ask yourself, what is one of these questions that you think will positively impact your own planning? And how does this tool better help you understand guided instruction? Pause and skim through the tool. I don't want to give you answers to these questions because they're very personal questions. But what I will say is when I look at this tool initially, I'm super overwhelmed. There's no way I'm going to think through all of this every single day for my guided instruction because I still have to plan formative tasks and ISA and blah, 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 so much. But what I find particularly helpful are these bold questions at the top, especially the first three. Big picture, what is it that I want my kids to learn during guided instruction? What problems are we going to do together? And what problems are they going to do alone? That reminds me of that cycle. What's the most important stuff that we're going to do together and they're going to do alone? I would ask you to pull up tomorrow or a future lesson plan and just to work through this first one. See, it's number one. It came from number one in the planning tool. Obviously, if you want to work through all parts, that's awesome. But for the sake of time, this is a good opportunity for you to just take five minutes to look at your lesson and to think to yourself, as I'm planning guided instruction, I want to make sure I'm super clear on what I want my students to take away. What is the most important new stuff? Concepts, terms, models, procedures. What is it? Take five minutes to work on that. Hopefully you took five minutes to plan and now you're back. And so as we start to get toward our wrap up, I wanna think about 
Why is it important that we connect to what students already did in the opening routine and formative task when you get to guided instruction? And how does our shift away from I do, we do, you do better support students' construction of knowledge? Those are two questions that I would pose to you to reflect on and to think about because those are key ideas that I want you to take away from this time together. We really want to make those connections. Think about why that's so impactful. And we want to help students truly construct knowledge. Why is that? And how does shifting away from I do, we do, you do help us to do that? Thank you so much for your time listening to this session, pausing to do some reading, reflecting, and planning. As always, if you have any questions, you can reach out to math at Phila SD, but there are also specific people here that you can reach out to if you have questions about um, grade band specific math. Again, thanks so much. Good luck.